So hello and welcome to today's info to go webinar. My name is Annie Gaines and I am the continuing education consultant here at the Idaho Commission for Libraries located in sunny Boise, Idaho. Our webinars and other continuing education opportunities are funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Everyone is muted on entry and we encourage you to use the chat feature to ask questions and discuss with other attendees. As you exit the webinar, you will be prompted to complete an evaluation and we always appreciate appreciate your honest feedback. Today's topic is library programming in the great outdoors, and I'm going to pass it over to Jennifer Redford, our youth services consultant, who will introduce our speakers. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Annie, and thank you everyone for attending, and thanks to all of you who are viewing this recording at a later date, which I know a lot of people do. They sign up for this just so they can treasure those those info to go moments. So um, thanks everybody for being here. Um, we live uh, in the great state of Idaho. It has um, a wealth of outdoor opportunities from the northern tip of the state to the southeastern most part. There is something to do outside in Idaho and Idaho's libraries do a really wonderful job incorporating our natural environment into their services and programs for their communities. And I'm very excited to bring together two pros at that, Cassie Allen from Twin Falls Public Library, who's gonna to talk to you about her nature brewery um, concept and the other things that her library does outside. And Sherry Schlein from the Donnelly Public Library, who's the director there. Um, Sherry's library, I believe is 700 square feet um, total. So um, she has a really wonderful outside space, which I think is two to three times the size of her actual inside space. Um, and her library does programming throughout the year, including in Idaho's snowy winters outside. And so she's going to share a little bit about what she does. And we have Michelle Youngquist here from Project Learning Tree, which um, is a wonderful arm of the Forest Division. And um, she has a lot of great continuing education opportunities for librarians to help them uh, use the natural environment of Idaho a little bit more intentionally in their programs and services. And she's going to talk to us about um, what her organization does and how libraries can tap into it. Um, everybody's going to speak for a little bit, kind of um, share their information, and then we will have time for lots of questions at the end. So um, if you do have questions, please save them up or comments. And if you have um, some great ideas to share with the group as well, and you aren't lucky enough to be a panelist today, please um, feel free to share those too when we get to the end of this program. We'll have lots of time for sharing. So again, thank you for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to Cassie to talk about what she does in Twin Falls. Hello, I, like Jennifer said, I'm Cassie Allen. I'm from the Twin Falls Public Library. And I, in the last two years, have never once had to share my screen. Can you believe that? So <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out right now. Um, I have a few photos I wanted to share. We do a lot of programming outside. Um, we do a lot of our just normal programming outside because the weather here is so beautiful in the summer. And then I have a couple of outdoor centric programs that I'll focus on a little more. So I thought I would just share a few photos. Um, Okay, is everybody seeing my, my? Um... Yep, looks great, Cassie. Okay, great, wonderful. Okay, so first I just wanted to show you a little map of what we have going on here. So our library is pretty big, it's three floors, and but we have a big population. So um, very often, especially during summer reading, we run out of space in our library for people. So these are just some of the spaces that we use and we do use all of them. We have this weird library lawn off to the right here. It's hard to get to with like a stroller because you, you have to pass through the parking lot. So um, we didn't start using it heavily until the last few years. And then we have this strange little back lawn um, and then a side lawn, we use both of those pretty heavily. And then we are fortunate enough to be right next door to the city park. So as long as we ask them to turn their sprinklers off, um, we can use the city park and we do. And then we also utilize, anyone who's been to Twin Falls knows that we have an abundance of trails and parks. So we try to utilize those as much as possible too. 
So these are just some programs we've had outside. Um, we had the College of Southern Idaho baseball team come teach us how to play baseball. That was in our um, library lawn. And then we had the College of Southern Idaho volleyball team come teach us how to play volleyball. I don't recommend doing that next to windows. Um, we had a club for a while called Kids Unplugged, where kids learned how to do like old world um, skills. And so that picture there is of a 4-H kid teaching our kids how to raise chickens on the lawn. Um, we've done a bicycle rodeo a few times. For this one, we, we close off the road between the um, park and the library. I don't know if you guys know you can do that. You can ask the city to just close a road off for you. We do it all the time. Um, and we had a giant bicycle rodeo with a bicycle parade and decorating stations and even a bicycle obstacle course. Um, we have block parties every year. So this is the road closed off again. Um, and we utilize the park and the library lawns for that. We have a DJ come, everybody dances in the street. We have giant bubbles. This year we're trying to get a mobile climbing wall for our block party. <laughs> so um, yeah, we like to celebrate outside. We do story walks, of course, and I made sure to include a cold weather story walk because we do do a lot of cold weather outdoor programming, but um, it's not always the prettiest, so we don't take a lot of pictures of it. But we do story walks all the time. Um, we do most of our summer reading activities outside, either on the library lawn or um, in the park. Do a lot of physical activities and art activities outside because then you don't have to worry about paint so much. We do story times outside. That's me conducting our story times on the library lawn. Um, we, you know, during COVID, we did them outside year round with just a heater, but um, now we're just, I mean, it's still COVID, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, now we're just doing them outside when the weather is really beautiful, which again, it's Idaho. So pretty often the weather is beautiful. We're, we're fortunate. Um, this is a new program. So this is one of our programs that is more um, nature centric. This is a new program called Strollerbrary. It's a once a week walk on um, a path in Twin Falls, we start the group. So it's it's caregivers. Basically, it's an excuse for caregivers to meet each other and walk with each other. Um, but there has to be an early literacy component because we're the library. So we all meet up at the walking path, whatever walking path we're using that week. And then I give them a short early literacy lesson. Um, they take the sheet and then we all just go for like an hour long walk. So um, this is two of the trails that we've done. This is the Canyon Rim Trail and the Orton Botanical Garden. And um, you know, the only, the only prerequisite for this um, program is that I just have to find trails that are stroller friendly, but we, we have a lot in Idaho. And I just started this program last month, um, but so far it's been really popular and really um, productive. And so I thought I would just show you kind of the, the early literacy stuff we talk about before our walk. Um, I'm, if anyone is curious about starting a program like this, I'm happy to help. I, this is just two examples of a handout that I might give out. Um, I, for one of these, I just, um, I just made it up. <laughs> and the other one I used a room um, prompt to help me sort of build the the language for what we were gonna give out but um yeah that one's really wonderful and um like last week we were on our walk and we saw a snake and so we all stopped to look at it the kids were a little more interested than the moms were and as we were walking away one of the little girls because we have a, um, a gratitude practice in our story times we're, we're really used to using gratitude language and as we were walking away, one of the little girls put her hand on her heart and said, I'm just so grateful we spent time with the snake today. <laughs> so it's a really great program. It really gets us out into nature. Um, and the other one I wanted to talk about is Nature Brewery. Notice I have a naming scheme, Stroller Brewery and Nature Brewery. <laughs> um, oh, let's see. So Nature Prairie is a program for pre-elementary kids to just do hands-on learning outside. I mostly do these in the park, 
Um, each week the kids get a little treasure map. I'll show you, I'll show you some examples of what is available to them. And then they just go do that on their own with their caregiver. So in this one, you'll see we had a mud pie week and the kids just had like dinosaurs and measuring cups and all the stuff that you would need to play in the mud um, in a kiddie pool filled with mud. And that was fun um, to get rid of, but. The kids loved it and most of them came away just covered in mud so we do tell the parents like this is a dirty program be prepared to get dirty on the right there they made paint brushes um, out of nature stuff twigs leaves um, whatever and then painted with liquid watercolors oh these things stop working oh and then um here's just a few other activities we've done it, it's a whole fleshed out program so we've done tons and tons of activities i just thought these were some good pictures uh here they're making their names out of nature objects super good fine motor skills they're cutting leaves they're cutting sticks they're gathering they're spelling their names they're interacting with the sensory um components of the objects um, on the right here is a bug discovery. So those bins are filled with um, dyed rice and beans, and they're either digging through, what a wonderful sensory experience, digging through to find the little plastic bugs or they're using the tweezers. Um, and then I have this little video, we did a sensory walk, um, different objects to feel with your feet. And I just love this little boy's experience feeling the whipped cream and then there's rocks. They really love to put their feet in the Orbeez. So it's hard to tear them away from that, <laughs> from that particular sensory experience. How nice. That must feel so good. <laughs> his grandpa's holding his hand for his balance and then um, wet rocks and then they could go again. But that's the kind of stuff we get to play with in Nature Bray that we don't get to play with inside the library because we don't necessarily want kids walking around with wet um, shaving cream. Did I say whipped cream? Shaving cream. Wet shaving cream feet in the library. Um, so as promised, here's here's some examples of the maps that I give them each week. It's totally self-led. So I have the really difficult job of sitting in a lawn chair in the park with a sun hat on. Um, just telling them to go have fun. I don't have to do much after the setup. And um, yeah, they just go to each each little um, station and uh, do their thing with their caregiver. And each station has language for the caregivers. If they've never, for example, if they've never done a measuring task with their child before, it has good language um, that they could use with their child if they wanted to and how to continue that play at home for free. Um, and then, yeah, I just wanted to compile some photos because our adult services does a lot of outdoor programming too. And um, they do a wonderful job with it, but I am usually just there as a participant. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, we do a lot. We do drive-in movies, we do um, workshops, classes, parties. Um, yeah, I think that's it for me. Thanks, Cassie. Um, it looks like you all have so much fun with your programs. And I um, I had listened to you give a similar talk at a for a different group. And you mentioned that your staff members actually really enjoyed being outside and had less instances of feeling ill during the year, probably because they had some of that great outside time. Yes, when we moved our story times outside especially in the children's department we have always had we've always been sick we're always sick. <laughs> we're ground zero for all the illnesses um but yeah when we moved all of our programming outside we completely stopped being sick i don't think i took a single sick day um in 2021 and that is totally um out of the norm for me and uh, yeah, our staff really, we find that it's easier to get volunteers to staff for, um, you know, I need a few extra staff members for whatever. If I'm going to be outside, yeah, I'd love to. So I think it's just more enjoyable for everyone altogether. The only downside is like you'll see in the flower arranging class there, we had to bring all those tables out. <laughs> 
so now we do have permanent tables um, in that lawn. They're not that big, so we still do have to bring stuff out once in a while, but that is the only downside that I see to outdoor programming. The schlepping, it's always a thing. Lots of schlepping. All right, well, thanks, Cassie, and I yeah. hope um, all of you have good questions to save up for, for Cassie later. Let's go ahead and move on to Sherry Schlein from the Donnelly Library, Donnelly Public Library. And Sherry is coming to us from the outside. Hi, Sherry. Hi. Um, the exciting thing is my shade keeps uh, falling over. So you're gonna see like one of the problems of, of our outdoor programming. Um, so I wanted to give you all a quick tour before I start, um, just because that way it'll help you understand our space a little better. And but I got to figure out how to switch my camera. Um, <laughs> so this is our outdoor space. Our library is super tiny. And you're probably wondering what these big old poles are. Um, we are building um, our outdoor classroom. We're actually setting up two large teepees. Um, I got them in November. And we've been fighting with our PNZ to um, erect them. And we have final approval last Wednesday. So. Now we're just waiting on the approval from the tribe and we're gonna have a teepee for an outdoor classroom. Um, this is our space. So we schlep a lot. So we have two different types of seating. Um, we have a chicken coop back here with our chickens. And this is our fire pit and there's garbage in it right now. Um, so that's our quick tour. And then I'm gonna get my slides up here. Um, Uh, hold on one second. And for those of you who are coming to us from a non-Idaho state, uh, Donnelly is located very close to McCall, Idaho. It's in the central part of the state, right in the heart of the mountains. Um, and they get lots and lots of snow. So the, um, the first thing is that we are in the mountains. So yesterday we had snow. And today it looks super sunny out when I just like showed you everything. And we do have green grass, but we don't have any, um, anything else blooming quite yet. We have some camas and some dandelions, but um, we do have uh, snow and the potential of snow most of the year. So it did snow yesterday, um, but we are expecting 70 on Thursday. So uh, um, Hi, Alice. <laughs> she just said um, it's her hometown from the chat. But uh, so the first slide, um, we do have a picture of some snow that was in January. And um, we have to just adapt. We have an after school program um, that goes Monday through Friday, and it runs 15 to 20 kids a day. And the reason that we started that was because uh, Don Lee did not have anything. We're as um, Jennifer said, we're nestled in between McCall and then Cascade is to the south of us. And both of those communities have um, a fully funded after school program. They both have uh, 21st century grant money. And so the two elementary schools that surround us um, had full after school programs. And Donley is a Title I school that's nestled in the middle and um, had no options for kids. And the unfortunate thing for Donley kids is they also don't get to participate in like after school sports. Uh, and that's primarily not just because um, it's not that they don't have access, they could go and play in McCall um, or Cascade. It's the parents don't um, have the time to drive them to and from those places. So there was really no other option. So we stepped in and we developed an after school program. And so to start my family, we have this guilty pleasure. We watch SWAT together and uh, SWAT, the leader Hondo is always stay, saying, stay liquid. And if I could give you one takeaway, um, it would be to stay liquid uh, for your after school programming. So we always have to adapt, make changes. Uh, the weather always changes. Uh, we do not have the option of going inside for our after school program. So we're forced to be outside. And so adapting is really, really important. And so we have to be ready for everything. So our biggest um, problems that we have are seasons, the weather, attendance, and Tuesdays. And the reason I put seasons and weather differently is uh, here we have summer reading 
which is a totally different thing that we can adapt to differently. And then the school year, uh, which is winter. Uh, we don't really have a spring and a fall. Uh, we joke that we have like 19 winters. So there's spring one day and then it's back to winter. So, um, and then the weather. So anytime the, the most difficult thing with the weather for us is this, it's not the snow, it's the rain and the wind. So on a day when there's five feet of snow on the ground, we're totally fine. It's just the wind is the um, problem. Attendance is our other problem. Uh, so the way that we're set up, uh, parents can do some drop-in. And so we could go anywhere from having six kids to having a day when we have 30 kids. And so those are some of our outdoor problems. Um, and then I, we put Tuesdays because it's the big joke that if anything goes wrong here, it is always on a Tuesday. And um, so on the pictures, this is me. I was actually reading a story, uh, the one in the upper uh, left. I was reading a story and I fell through the snow and it was legit deeper than that. But one of the kids had to come out and pull me out. Eventually we had to dig me out because I could not get out. Um, so my biggest things about uh, outdoor programming is your seating. Uh, seating is super important. And I know that she talked about our tables. We, uh, because of the snow, we built um, like actual benches in our snow because we didn't want kids like sitting. So the kids, you can see in one of these photos, um, they're, they're actually sitting on benches that we made in the snow. Um, not having the kids on the ground is super important for us. And um, it just helps because when they're on the ground, it's, they're so distracted. So we purchased some bean bags. And then this year we got um, the super cool spider web bouncy chairs and Midas gold, which is Perpetua now purchased them for us. Um, the other thing is our waiting period. Um, so one of the problems outside is we got to figure out what activities we're going to allow the kids to do during their waiting period. So when we're switching activities, do we want them to run? Do we want them to stay stationary? Um, and so we always plan for our waiting period as well. And then um, the activities, we always make sure that whatever game we're playing or um, anything also has one other thing that we plan to throughout the day that we don't necessarily plan on doing, but we have it as our backup because after school programming goes so fast and we want the kids engaged most of the time and we don't want them leaving the property line. So our activities are like during this summer, we built this summer, this winter, we built a maze through the snow. And um, so it was like a hit, hidden maze all through the snow. And I wish I had pictures of it from, uh, the air, but I did not get them. And next is our outdoor tech. So our kids still use devices outside. So we got, ICFL provided us with super great Wi-Fi. So we have a Wi-Fi um, uh, just right behind me. And so it works uh, throughout the entire yard. It, it actually goes about 300 yards from the, um, the actual library. And the next thing is, everything's a mistake. We make so many mistakes. And um, we had to realize that um, not everything when we're doing outdoor programming uh, is going to be successful, but it's also not all going up in smoke. And so we learned that wisdom comes from our mistakes and we adapt to the changing needs. And that in the end, when I just told you that tech was important and we still have tech outside, we also realized that it's not important. Um, so on the days that it doesn't work for some reason, we just adapt. Um, we do after school snacks. And um, when I say up in smoke, we have a fire pit and we cook most of our after school snacks on the fire pit. And I know some people are like, how is that USDA? Uh, how is that? It's things like hot dogs. The kids roast hot dogs a lot. We have hot dogs all the time. Um, we, we cook, uh, we just did 80 days around the world and we had world snacks from all over and we would, um, we have a, cook them in a pot on the, on the fire pit. We do everything on our little tiny fire pit. Um, and there's lots of cooking mistakes. We burn a lot of stuff. Um, the kids burn a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, uh, we just I, adapt to our changes and forgive ourselves for the mistakes. My biggest advice for after school programming um, is also to be brave. Um, try something that you uh, 
is unconventional. Um, think outside of the normal box and um, enjoy the programming aspects. We just celebrated um, Holy, which is a, um, a holiday because we were doing 80 days around the world. And that's why the kids have uh, colored powder all over their faces. Uh, it was a wonderful experience for the kids. They had a great time. Um, also, uh, being brave, we have chickens. So the kids asked to raise chickens and we contacted the city and made sure that it was okay if we had a chicken coop in the city limits. And so the kids have incubated chickens and are raising chickens and they built their own chicken coop uh which was wonderful for them they're responsible for cleaning it they're responsible for uh, making sure the chickens are fed and i do absolutely nothing with it i um allow the kids to date do that last is stay liquid uh staying liquid is just adapting to all of the changes that um come with the day so our biggest changes are weather the seasons um our attendance and of course the problematic Tuesdays. And um, that's about it. For programming wise, we always create our own curriculum. Uh, for camp this for um, summer reading this year, we actually do a summer camp that goes from eight to five, uh, Monday through Friday. And the reason that we do that is when we ask our parents, uh, we did a survey of what they wanted for summer reading. And the biggest thing was childcare. And unfortunately, Valley County as a whole has a child care crisis, and we just don't have that as an opportunity. And so we actually um, charge uh, for our summer camp, and we have an outdoor summer camp um, that goes Monday through Friday. And one week each month, and once it fails, then we offer a second week. So we are uh, two weeks in June right now, and still and two weeks in August, and just one in July. Uh, so everything we do is outside. Uh, we just adapt and we utilize all of our community partners. So 4-H, um, we utilize, we utilize the, uh, vacation rental place next door. We use their refrigerator, um, all the time. <laughs> and, uh, the school, we also have an outdoor sink, which was purchased during COVID, which was actually one of our best purchases that we could have made during COVID. Um, in the beginning, we had it right in front of the door of the library. And so before people would even come into the library, we just asked them to wash their hands. And then the masks were sitting right next to it. So we didn't have that mask battle that a lot of people had because once they washed their hands, they would just grab a mask. It was just like, um, kind of like a, a force of habit that wasn't a habit. You just reached over and were like, oh, I just washed my hands as I'm gonna take a mask. Um, it worked great. Um, our outdoor sink was purchased from Home Depot and was like $2,500. And it works wonderful. Uh, we um, move it all around the yard now. So it's usually pretty close to where the chicken coop's at. So we can make sure the kids wash their hands before and after they touch the chickens. Um, the sink has soap and water and everything. Um, I do recommend that. The wonderful thing for us is our indoor sink um, is super tiny. It's like a, um, a very weird bathroom sink that's really small. And so we can't wash out paint pots or anything like that but our outdoor sink is really deep. And so we can wash um, like paints and um, oftentimes clean clothes and things like that. I'm also brilliant at getting free things. So as you can see from this front picture, uh, the library's rock shirts, that was from the Idaho Libraries Association conference a few years ago. It was the leftover shirts and they were all like smalls. And the lady at the table said, would you like these? And I was like, yes, I would. And four years later, I am still using uh, the same paint shirts and the kids use them all the time. Um, so anytime I can get things for free, I will take them. Um, I will um, be the first one to sign up. Also our library budget, just so people know, just cause I know that that's a good comparison. Our library budget's only 65,000 a year. So um, we do a lot of things by beg borrowing and pleading. Um, and like Alice is on right now, a few years ago, our summer reading prizes were all from the Emmett Library leftovers. Um, so anytime we can get things for free at our little library, uh, we totally um, seize that opportunity. And I encourage even libraries that are well-funded to still um, take that opportunity. And um, that's it. Thanks, Sherry. Um, I think that's a, your library is just such a great example of when you have the advantage of a smaller community, you can really build those relationships with your kids and 
do projects that don't last just the one library session, like making a chicken coop and taking care of the chickens. Um, it's a real advantage to being in um, kind of a closer knit community and a smaller community. Um, yeah, great job. That's fantastic. Um, so I hope many of you have questions for Sherry or uh, are looking up how to buy your own outdoor sink as we speak. Um, <laughs> before we move on to Michelle, I would encourage everyone to follow um, the Donnelly Library and the Twin Falls Library on social media because they both are really great about posting a lot of these outdoor activities. And there's, if you're looking for ideas, um, just go through the, the back um, comment or the back posts, um, the archives for both their social medias because well worth your time. Okay, we're gonna switch gears now and move on to Michelle Youngquest from Project Learning Tree. And she's going to um, expand our um, resources a little bit more and talk about um, what her organization does. Michelle? Great. Thanks, Jenny, Jennifer. Um, it's so nice to be here. I'm just always in awe of librarians, so I'm just honored to be able to be in your midst today. I find librarians to be the most adaptable, now I know to say the most liquid, um, creative, energetic, optimistic people, and that you spread joy everywhere you go and with everything you do. So thank you for what you do, and I'm thrilled to be here to share a little bit about what we have to um, help you with at Project Learning Tree and the Idaho Forest Products Commission. So is everyone, let's see, I can just switch the view. Seeing a, my slide. No, not yet. It's, uh, it says Michelle has started screen sharing, but nothing is sharing. All right. Well, oh, there you go. lies our it's, issue. It's there now. Uh, okay. I really need Sherry's connections with the internet. I want her to have someone install that wonderful Wi-Fi for me. <laughs> All right. So... I am Michelle Young because I'm the Education Program Manager for the Idaho Forest Products Commission, and that includes being the State Coordinator for Idaho Project Learning Tree. And um, I will put these, these links in the chat after I finish. But we have lots and lots of things to share with you and um, can just scratch the surface today. So we have free activities and support from Project Learning Tree. We've got information and materials from the Forest Products Commission. We have an array of professional development opportunities for you, both short courses, long courses, in-person, um, virtual. We can tailor training specifically to your needs. Um, we have the award-winning Project Learning Tree materials. We have some youth opportunities through the Forest Products Commission. We have some forest education grants through Forest Products Commission that are available to anybody who helps learn um, about trees and forests, helps youth or really anyone learn about trees and forests. And so we, um, it's not just teachers and we are pretty flexible and we wanna help you do all the important things you do. So please call on us. Both of the things that I'm gonna talk about today are really, really comprehensive programs with an awful lot of stuff that I would love to share with you. But today is just gonna be about giving you some shortcuts to the lowest hanging fruit. And Jennifer, is this showing screens or is it a long delay? Um, I think you're good. Uh, if you want to, you could maybe turn off your video. Sometimes that helps with bandwidth. Good plan. Great. All right, so Project Learning Tree is a national and international program. So those of you who are here, I saw someone from Maine and I don't know if there's other people from other states, but you have Project Learning Tree in your state too. So it is a national program of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and then each state has its own program under that um, big national umbrella. And in Idaho, our Project Learning Tree program is at the Idaho Forest Products Commission. But Project Learning Tree has been around since the mid 1970s. So it's going on almost 50 years of being a leader in the field of environmental education. And it has done that by keeping up. So it is really good at continuing to figure out what are the best ways to teach and what are the 
current issues and the current topics and all of the things and then pr providing really high quality materials and trainings that help to get those into people's hands that work with youth. So essentially Project Learning Tree provides activities and resources to engage youth in learning about the environment and it uses the lens of trees and forests. So our most low hanging fruit is that you have libraries full of books and you have outdoor space that hopefully is accessible to you. And so trees and books naturally go together and um, just taking a book out and reading to a tree or reading near a tree or exploring a tree with the book in hand, all of those are really very easy to do and don't take anything special to add to that. And I'm just so amazed at the things that I learned from Cassie and from Sherry today that you're already doing. Um, for the low hanging fruit of Project Learning Tree, I would send you to the National PLT website, which is plt.org. And you see the landing page, hopefully there. And there's um, the menu across the top. I've pulled out the resources drop down menu. And I would suggest that you start there. And when you have more time than today, I would encourage you to explore every single one of those items under the resources drop down menu because each of them is going to take you on a little deep dive of lots and lots of resources. It's sort of like going underground and going through tunnels and finding all kinds of good stuff. So keep track of things that you find that you like so that you know how to get back to them. But the thing that I'm going to um, send you to today is the free activities for families. So you would select that at the bottom of the resources drop down menu and when you get to that page you will see links to more pages divided by types of activities so whether you're walking in a forest exploring a local park in your own backyard or when all of is inside um, you'll find over 50 activities available to you all of them free and essentially most of them are shortened versions of the more comprehensive activities that are in the project learning tree activity guides and the instructions for doing the activity and any um, visuals that you need will be on that website and often they will link um, a book or two to those activities but if you want them to be portable or something that you send home with kids or families they are also downloadable as pdfs and often are also in spanish so that you get there at the resources tab drop down to free family activities or you can just go to the link that i have shown you another great way to find some of the massive wealth of stuff that is on this website is to just use the search function so here i just put in the word reading and it popped up with these things so when you click on any one of those you're going to get a long list of books for recommended reading for example for grades k through two and it'll highlight the books it will highlight some activities that you can do with the books it will connect to any project learning tree activities that go well with it and um, it's just a great way to go um, find what you need at this website another um, a couple good words were just book and books and literacy or literature helped me to find all kinds of things that I wasn't finding through the extensive menus. Um, in addition to the free things, there are things that are not free through Project Learning Tree. So there's a comprehensive amount of, of curriculum materials really. So teachers and classrooms have been the primary audience for Project Learning Tree, but over the years, many, many, many non-formal educators have found that they really can use what Project Learning Tree has to offer. So I'm just showing you a few of the, the core sort of um, materials that we have just released this spring was the new early childhood approach, which is Trees and Me, and it's for exploring nature with young children aimed at families and teachers of kids that are ages one through six. The Explore Your Environment K-8 activity guide was released last year. That's the big comprehensive book of 50 activities for kindergarten through eighth grade with a lot of variations in between those. And um, then the Green Jobs Exploring Forest Careers is aimed more at middle school and high school and into early college level. 
looking at different types of green jobs, forest related and otherwise. And then on the left is the forest literacy framework. That one's not something you have to purchase. It's free at the plt.org website, but it's a um, listing of a hundred concepts that are helpful for people to know to be literate about forests. So the way that you get the curriculum materials is you can take trainings through us, through Idaho Project Learning Tree, or they're available just for purchase from the National PLT website. Um, if you choose to come to a Project Learning Tree training or have us do one with you, um, that, sorry, we have, that will, um, we've got a whole menu of different kinds of things that you can take. So. The place that I'm going to send you for your low hanging fruit for the Forest Products Commission resources, and I should back up and say the Forest Products Commission is a state agency in Idaho that's funded by assessments on people who work in the forest products industry. So if they cut trees, haul trees, or process trees, they by law have to pay into the commission. And then we work with lots and lots of partners who all contribute to make sure that we've got a broad base of support to get these materials and opportunities out to people in Idaho. So I will recommend that you start on our website, idahoforests.org at the education tab. And um, there's so much on there that I broke it into a few slides. So um, the learning at home resources we put together in response to COVID and it still has a lot of stuff that I would recommend you take some time to look at. Lots of resources, not just from us, but other agencies and organizations that can help you with your outdoor explorations or to support the knowledge that kids are learning when they go outside. Um, the virtual and in-person person PD, that's where you'll find our list of Project Learning Tree workshops. The K-12 grade level learning resources are um, just ways to help you narrow down if you've got specific grade levels that you wanna look at. I mentioned earlier that we have some opportunities for youth and one of those is our photo contest every year for Arbor Day. And um, you'll wanna go to that part of the website to see the very nice photos that um, were awarded awards just this uh, last month for Arbor Day. We had five first place winners and 19 honorable mentions and they're all from fifth through 12th grade students in Idaho. There's also a high school video contest about highlighting forest careers. And all of these things are things that um, we would really welcome the help of librarians to help kids know about these opportunities. They don't have to be connected to a school in order to, co to participate in the contest. So anything you can do to help them, like if you wanna take kids out and have them be doing their photographs for um, getting ready to submit to the Arbor Day photo contest, that would be great. Um, the Through the Trees video contest is, contest is actually for four states. It is um, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and Montana. And this year, the first place team that won was from Victory Middle School in uh, Meridian. So that was exciting. I already mentioned the forest education grants. We have funded some things at libraries and we'd love to fund more. They're small grants, only $250, but we know what you guys can do with a little bit of money. Tree Cookies is one of our information pages written at good kid level, but good for everybody. And that is one of our best hands-on teaching tools, our Tree Cookies. And then another feature about lots of Idaho people who work in forest-related jobs. So if you're helping um, kids learn about what they might be able to do in the future, that's a good resource. We have both print and electronic newsletters that we'd be happy to add you to the list for. Our forest history supplement is about um, forest history. So it looks like a scrapbook and is very visual and we are happy to get you um, sets of printed guides where all of them are as PDFs on our website. The teaching resources we'll come back to and we have a forest tour that we take teachers and counselors on. A couple more of the um, info sorts of pages, one on forest insects and diseases, one on all the amazing stuff that we get from trees besides um, just wood and paper. And then our most popular is how paper is made. That's a great resource. If you're gonna do hands-on paper making, we do have paper making lending kits that we can send you that have the screens and some pulp and other sorts of things, but you can find the um, videos on our website that show the process that we use in our kit as well as show videos of how paper is made in Idaho at Idaho's paper mill in Clearwater or 
Clearwater and Lewiston. And then one more opportunity for kids is we've got a fall essay contest for K through 12 and we'd love for librarians to help us get the word out about that. We also have lots of free materials. We can send you posters, bookmarks, sheets, um, brochures, all kinds of different things, Trees of Idaho booklets to use when you're having kids be outside and explore. Um, you just go to our website and set, put in your order or just ask me. And I have a special gift for Idaho libraries while the supplies last, and you guys are the first to know. So if you guys take them all, then I won't put out a big call to everybody else through Jennifer. Um, but as I mentioned, we have brand new from National PLT, we have the brand new um, Trees and Me Early Childhood Guide. And that means I have some supplies of our previous early childhood materials, which was environmental experiences for early childhood. Comes with a book full of about a hundred little activities and um, a supporting CD. The CD isn't so much music as it is sounds that go along with the, the different activities. And if you would like to have one or more of those to either put in your collection or to use for you and your staff or whoever, um, email me at plt at idahoforest.org with that information and I will get them out. I um, probably won't do it until July though. So don't panic if you don't see it right away. So I'm um, very thankful to have had some time to share with you and hope there's time for some questions. I encourage you to dive into both of the websites, plt.org for national plt, idahoforest.org for the Forest Products Commission. Swim around in there, bar, bookmark what you find. Um, keep continuing to connect youth with nature in Idaho's amazing backyard. Request free materials from me if they can help you um, take PLT workshops or arrange to have us do one specifically for library folks. And if you are just so confused by the amazing amount of stuff that there is, just ask me and I'm, I'm happy to help, help you find what it is that you need. So thanks. Thanks for letting me be here today and I look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was um, that was a lot of resources. I um, I definitely didn't realize you had that much stuff, and I've looked around on your page quite frequently. So, um, wow, I'm really glad we had you here to talk about that. All right, um, we have about 12 or 13 minutes left in our uh, hour together. So I'm going to open it up for any questions for Cassie, Sherry, or Michelle. Um, if you have questions about the programs the librarians shared or some of the resources that Michelle shared, um, you can either put them in the chat. Annie, are they able to unmute and ask a question as well? Nope, you are not able to unmute and ask a question. You have to write it in the chat. Um, so while you're doing that, I'll just throw it back to Cassie really quickly. Cassie, do you have a favorite program you've done or one that you will never ever do again um i love mud pies that is i think my favorite um, nature bright is so fun every part of nature bright is so fun um as for ones i'll never do again i don't know i um i did sun prints one time with the little kids and for sun prints you have to wait and I just hated how like hands on for me that was and how much waiting there was. Um, I like them to be pretty independent, but I have I haven't really had any big disasters. Um, when Sherry was talking about weather, I mean, we're in the desert, we're really dry, we don't really have any precipitation, but we do have wind. So um, I have jars that I have filled with like oil and water and glitter. So they're pretty and I use those to hold everything down <laughs> because we do sometimes have wind issues. But I mean, I always tell parents like you're raising in Idaho and it, it, it's part of it. So they just have to like wind. Yeah, um, I love the jars idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. So many little tidbits we're getting here. Yeah. And I've, I've learned too that like parents are usually a little more fair weather than I am. Like we just had a walk and that morning it was like 40 degrees and I thought it was no big deal for our stroller break program. 
and I only got like five families. <laughs> I was like, like, look at what Donnelly's doing. You can come for 40 degrees sunny. I mean, every time I see the Donnelly Library do their programs in like January, I'm like, that's bold, Sherry, Sherry. I don't know how you do it. Um, so Karen says that she's looking for sources and activities for older kids, um, adults and seniors, any suggestions? So I had, um, I'm gonna take my, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, you, you sound good. I just took my um, earphones off. Um, so I had these two books out here uh, this morning, but I do a lot of activities from these two books. Um, one is Let the Kid Guide, and um, the activities in here are good for adults as well as children. Um, but for the older kids, this is like my go-to because I really like the kids to be in charge. Um, I let the kids run their activities a lot of the time. And this Let the Kid Guide, um, it's by Margot Angstrom. Um, it's putting nature back into our lives. Uh, it has activities in it. It also talks about the importance of letting the kid take control. And I recommend this for older kids. And then also, um, last child in the woods I have out here. And I also recommend this book. Um, it talks about the importance of learning outside and, um, saving our children from nature deficit disorder. And, uh, I'm a big learner in nature itself. Like I love when the kids explore outside and the older kids love it. So I let the older kids use apps like I seek nature, um, which is a picture app. And we have phones at the library, um, that the kids get to use in addition to iPads. The phones are, we're surplus from the state of Idaho, uh, Idaho commission for library surplus. And I was like, I need these to make ro use robots. Um, but the I Seek Nature app allows them to identify flowers outside. So we'll just be outside. And with the older kids, I have them identify at least 10 new items um, with the kids, with the littler kids. So they become the teachers. And I, I find that when they are the teachers, they learn more. And uh, it's, a, it's a program for them in and of itself. And I can put both of these books down in the chat. Thanks, Sherry. Please do. Um, that's a great example of, you know, really empowering children, giving, and um, Cassie's programs as well, giving youth choice and voice in what they're learning and how they're experiencing nature. Um, that's fantastic. I was also just going to, those books are great, and I can't wait to look into them. I was also going to add the Let's Move in Libraries newsletter and website. Um, Noah is a wealth of information on, they mostly talk about physical, physical programming, but a lot of that programming happens outside. So, I'll, you know, libraries from across the country, actually it's international, libraries everywhere are doing gardens and yoga courses and lots of outdoor stuff and physical stuff for all ages. So kids and adults. Awesome. I love Let's Move in Libraries. Me too. It's good. It's a good um, way to connect with other people from around the country as well. Um, so we've had a couple of questions about story walks in the chat. Um, in case you haven't done a story walk before, the way that it works is that you actually buy a book and then cut it up uh, and use the actual pages of the book and post them, usually in some sort of protected um, pedestal or podium or something. Um, so it's protected from the weather. So it's usually covered in like plexiglass or something like that. And you um, space the pages out along a trail so that as families walk together, they read the first page together and see the pictures and talk about it. And then they move on to the second one. And um, there is an official story walk website where you can purchase things. Um, uh, you can purchase the like pre-made books, but you're limited to the books that they have um, available um, as well. And let's see, Alice said that she has been doing story walks for a long time and she's happy to share. So Alice, if you don't mind when Annie does her, I think she usually does a follow-up email with resources, we might just include a note that 
if you would like uh, pointers from the Emmett Public Library, email Alice. <laughs> oh, she, and she said you can do that. Thank you. And Sherry put the books in the chat. Awesome. We will um, respond to Karen's question about older kids. Um, Project Learning Tree has a couple of um, more free things that I didn't mention. There's one called Teaching with iTree, and iTree is an urban forestry sort of um, connection, and it's a way for people to identify the trees in their yard or schoolyard or library yard and um, measure them and then put them in an in an app that helps to calculate the, the value of the ecosystem services that that tree provides. So you can find, you know, what kind of energy savings it gives you. If you place it on which side of your house, will it do better? Um, does it make a difference if it's in a public space or a private space? And it will give you, you know, how much carbon the tree is holding, all kinds of great things. And it's just really eye-opening to look at that and and usually kids I think will run with it once they've done one or adults and then another one is that I would suggest you check out is the green schools program in project learning tree not so much for the becoming a green school but for the lessons that are in there so there are green school investigations that investigate five different elements and it would be something like for those of you who have ongoing programs with the same same youth would be something that they could even study about the library itself and how to make it a more sustainable space. Um, last but not least, this is just something that I thought of while Sherry was showing the picture of the kids on their on their snow seats. And um, you probably already use these, but my favorite teaching tool is an insulite butt pad. And it is just taking those cheapest of the thin insulate pads for, you know, back when you were young and could sleep on those kinds of things when you camped. Um, cut them up into about one foot square size pieces, give each kid one, they can sit on wet stuff, they can kneel on wet stuff, they can sit on snow and their butt stays warm. And it makes a huge difference with what you can do. You can lie down under a tree on those things and sketch or write poetry or read or whatever, and you are safe from becoming wet and cold. So, thanks. Thank you for those resources, Michelle. I love all the um, the citizen science happening there, and um, there's just so much you can do. I love it, and I love um, the technology that some of you have incorporated to learn more. I recently found out that um, an iPhone, when you take a picture of a plant, you can take a picture of the plant. And then when you go and look at the plant, the picture in your photos, there's a little eye at the bottom. And if you click on that, it will give you all of the like data that you can, will tell you what plant it is, first of all. So we'll identify it for you. And it will tell you like the scientific name for it and where it grows and similar plants. And um, my mind has been blown. <laughs> And Alice, we will look up there. There's like an official story walk website. I will try to find it before we end today, but I don't know if I'll be able to. Oh, maybe. I found a couple. Yeah, there's a couple. Um, Jen, do you mind if I talk for a second about book displays? Please do. So we do outdoor book displays at all of our programs. Um, we set up a table with books that are relevant. So um, like if we're doing nature brewery, we might have books about seeds or you know whatever. And then we do an outdoor checkout station. So if you have like an outreach um, computer that like we have one on our bookmobile and so that's what we use and we just check out books outside. But that I think, um, for my when I was kind of selling the idea of outdoor programs I think that helped me sell that that idea because um, you know you want people in the building because you want them checking things out and you want them interacting with materials but um, I think bringing the materials to them outside helped kind of sell that and those items check out like crazy so we've had a lot of luck with doing those outdoor displays and um, I, I highly recommend that if you're trying to sell outdoor programming to your administration. 
Yes, because we know the universal language of libraries is statistics. Yes. And we need to count how many people come to the programs, how many people check the check out the things. And, and we signed up a lot of people for library cards at those programs too. And that's another big statistic. That's huge. Happy. Yeah. That's fantastic. All right, my friends, it is uh, one to the hour. So we're coming to the end of our time together. Thank you so much for um, being with us today. If you're watching the recording, thanks for hanging in there and learning all this great stuff with us. Um, Sherry and Cassie, thanks for sharing what you're doing in your libraries. It always blows me away how much you can do with your own internal creativity and also with such limited resources. So um, both of you are, like I said at the beginning, complete pros at this. And thanks, Michelle, for sharing all the great resources available from Project Learning Tree. Um, always, always so much, uh, like a, so much to, to mine there. So thank you. Annie, do you have some last uh, housekeeping items for us? Um, <clears throat> not really, just to say thank you so much for joining us today. And you will be prompted to complete an evaluation as you exit the webinar. And we always appreciate your honest feedback. Um, but other than that, I hope you have a great afternoon and I will end the recording now.